Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 15th, 2013. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Steve Wilkes and I travel to Salt Lake City to help judge the Beehive Brew-Off and to celebrate five years of legal brewing in Utah. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. On Facebook, I'm at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page on Facebook is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link in our basicbrewing.com site. Uh, you know how it works. Whenever you want to shop on Amazon, don't go to Amazon first. Go to our website first, basicbrewing.com. Click on our link, and then it will take you to Amazon where you'll be shopping just as normal. The only difference is that you'll be helping to support this show. won't cost you any extra. We greatly appreciate your time and effort. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes and our Android app on Amazon.com. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. And we're on the Windows phone directory, too. Check out our Brewer's Logbook at BasicBrewingShop.com. In the front is a blank calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews. And there is room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of beer. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. Thanks to everybody who has done so already. Uh, and protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. We've got a lot of sound for you this week, but I do want to mention a couple of things. Uh, maybe by the time you hear this, there will be a new Basic Brewing video episode out there with a, a little documentary uh, that I, I made following the creation of the sour beer that Fossil Cove brewer Ben Mills scaled up from my homebrew recipe. Man, it is a tasty one. I didn't mention it in the uh, in the episode, but uh, Ben is serving it with uh, raspberry and woodruff syrups. And, uh, man, it's good. And in this week's uh, video episode, you'll get to uh, see Ben's system at work and uh, how the sour mash changes over 72 hours. Really interesting, fun stuff. Also, if you've been reading beerandwinejournal.com, you know that I actually posted three stories uh, since last episode. Uh, one was about the expansion of uh, the largest brewery in our area, Core Brewing. Uh, Core has added a bunch of uh, fermentation vessels and bright tanks and should be able to take advantage of that with their 25-barrel system. So I look forward to hearing uh, more from them, and I look forward to buying core beer in cans, which Jesse Core says is on the way in a month or so, a month or two. Uh, their ESB, by the way, is very tasty. Okay, let's get on to the meat of the matter. A, a couple of weekends ago, Steve Wilkes and I traveled to Salt Lake City to take part in the Beehive Brew Off. We got to talk to old friends and to practice our judging skills. We start off by sitting in on judging stouts. Okay, we're sitting here. We're at the uh, Beehive Brew Off. I think the fifth Beehive Brew Off. Across, the, across the, the aisle from me, at another table, Steve Wilkes. Hey, James, it's good to be in Salt Lake City. <laughs> Are you having fun? I'm having a great time. How about you? So far, so good. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of paired. You are sitting with, um, with uh, Bryce. Introduce yourself, Bryce. Hi, I'm Bryce Schultzke. Uh, I'm excited to sit with you guys. I've been listening to your show for a long time, so it's a surprise that I'm actually uh, sitting here judging with you, so it's a pleasure. Dreams do come true. <laughs> <laughs> this oh, one, can this I one, only wake up soon? <laughs> yeah, this one may be a nightmare by the end of the day. <laughs> so so are you a, uh, would you say that you're a novice judge, or what's your judging level? Uh, yeah, I'm a novice judge. I've uh, been brewing for a while, and uh, Jamie at the uh, Beer Nut... Um, yeah, I went in there to brew a beer, and she just asked me if I'd like to, to judge, so I said, sure. So I signed up, and uh, this is my I, my first judging. So, But I've been drinking beer for a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. That counts. We have, a, we have a professional here to help guide us through the, uh, through the competition, give us some advice. Uh, Matt, introduce yourself. 
Hi, my name is Matt Beamer. I'm uh, the brewmaster at the Wasatch Brew Pub in Park City, Utah. And I've been a professional brewer for 17 years. I've been judging probably 14 years of those, both professional and, you know, uh, homebrew competitions. So, you know, I've got uh, an experienced palate, I, I should say. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for being here, you guys. I know flying out here to, to, to Utah, it's, most people don't think it's a beer mecca, but I think uh, we hold our own, you know, so it's... Uh, it's great to have you guys here. Yeah, Steve and I went out to uh, Squatters and uh, Red Rock last night and uh, had some tasty beers and some good food and some good camaraderie with a college pal of mine. And uh, so we're, are, are you up to the task yet this morning, Steve? I, I've recovered nicely from the Red Rock Saison. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. We, we were splitting beers by that point. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so Matt, uh, give us some advice. I mean, you know, here we've, here we've got Bryce. This is your first first judging. Cu- first judging. Steve, this is your second. second, and this is my third. So yeah. we don't get out there much. Yeah. So give us some advice. What are we doing here? Okay, well, you know, judging is, is it can be difficult for some people because everyone wants to judge what they like. And my advice is I don't care what you like. Put that aside because we're going to judge the beers. Some of them you may not like. Some of them you may love. And that's irrelevant at this point because it, really what there is to do is to judge the beer in front of you, whether it hits the parameters of the style guidelines, you know. And if it does, if it meets all those parameters, then your like and dislike may, you know, favor the overall impression of the beer. But, you know, you could be judging a style you absolutely hate, but that doesn't matter. Because if you can perceive the flavors and aromas that are supposed to be in there from the, from the guidelines... That's all that matters as long as you can perceive those and, and acknowledge that they're there, if it's appropriate for them to be there or not. Yeah, you are, we are, we do have the, we are doing stouts, different uh, subcategories of the stouts, uh, and there are printed in the BJCP guidelines, there, there are the rules. And it doesn't matter whether you prefer stouts that are this way or that way, these are the rules that you're judging against. And that kind of gives, I mean, it it's, makes it more fair because you, it, you're judging against a standard. And it's a very specific standard as well. You know, there's, there's some leeway, but there's also this is okay and this is not okay. And if it meets that, then you get to say, well, I like this a little bit better. And then, that, you know, that could give it on a higher plateau than others that fit the same category, the same, you know, uh, the same milestones. So what uh, Steve and Bryce have gotten their first beer already. So what we're and here we we're, we've got ours. So what do we do first? I mean, how do we how do we approach this? Okay. Well, we've got our call sheet of all the different uh, the beers we're doing. We just need to look at the the number here. Uh, so we're we're doing 13A. We're doing dry stout, and the number is 246. So you know, obviously, judging with you want to have. You want to have your your style guidelines with you. You know, I, I'm I'm sure for the BJCP test, you need to know this stuff inside and out. But it's really good to have this as a reference point, so you can really, you know, not try to remember, but actually know that you're drinking what's supposed to be there. Right. So, you know, the first thing to do is just go through the whole guideline of the of the style, and and you know, and then we'll pour the beer and we'll we'll start uh, start talking about it or drinking it and talking about it. Okay. So in in front of us is the beer score sheet, and it is uh, uh, it's divided into uh, descriptor definitions uh, like a acetaldehyde, alcoholic, astringent, diacetyl. All the all these uh, uh, flavors on the left hand side and on the right hand side. It's divided into aroma, appearance, flavor, mouthfeel, overall impression. Each one of these has uh, uh, is uh, let's see. Oh my. I usually have an opener, but I don't have an opener. But each one is, is uh, uh, weighted as far as the, the um, amount of score that it contributes. Uh, so we have to just think about this, look at this, and uh, kind of just take it step by step. So the first thing we want to look at is, you know, the bottle presentation. I just opened it. it the fill level is, is okay. Um, if it's too low, that may, you may have gushing issues. You may have, you know, uh, or, or just flat issues. If it's over full, you know, that could be an issue as well. So this looks pretty good. Nice little pop when I open the, the cap, so I think that's a good sign. So um, that's the first bottle inspection appropriate size cap, fill level, label removal. So we can check that as, as uh, that's all within specs. So that, that doesn't contribute to the score, but it's a, it's a little checkbox. It's a good starting point. 
Okay, so we filled the we filled the beers. Now the first thing you want to do is take a look at the beer. You know, does it fit the color? Does it fit the you know? Does it have any off? Just initial looking at it, is there something off about it? And there's not. So we want to go right down the list. Aroma is the first thing. That's the most you know fleeting part of the beer. So we want to catch that aroma instantly. See, so swirl the glass a little bit, and it releases some of the aroma from the carbonation. Get your nose right in there and just start to decipher what, you, what you're picking up. And then write down the notes. So this is a dry stout? It is a dry stout. And the descriptions or the, uh, the style guidelines says coffee-like, roasted barley, and roasted malt aromas are prominent. May have slight chocolate, cocoa, and or grainy secondary notes. Yeah, that's right. The first thing I pick up is, is definitely a coffee-like, roasty flavor. And I pick up a slight caramel note. Um, not enough to dominate over the roast, but it's there to really complement it. I also pick up a secondary cocoa aroma as well. Not quite a dark chocolate, but a light, fluff, light fluffy cocoa is what I, would, what I would associate it with. And I'm not smelling any off characteristics. No, I think, it's, I think it hits the parameters um, quite well. You know, the esters are, are, are low. There's, there's no diacetyl, no buttery. Um, you know, it's just a, just a nice cocoa, roasted, slight caramel nose. In your opinion, is it, is it harder to figure out what to write for good beers over bad beers? <laughs> Actually, no, because what I do is I'll say, wow, I pick up this, I'll write it down. Oh, I sense this, I'll write it down. Mm. If it's an issue, I'll still write it down, but I might say, next time, look out for this. You know, if it's you know if it's a buttery, it's a buttery uh, you know diacetyl type flavor. You might want to say something like, "Well, you know, um, the the, the diacetyl is kind of overtaking this and this and this. You know, be careful on sanitation. Be careful on you know if it's a yeast that's prone to throw out a diacetyl flavor. You know, if it is, it's not like you know. You know, perhaps a diacetyl rest could help. You know, you you want to give some constructive criticism and at the same time acknowledge that something is off in the beer so they can they can you know take the time and pick up that for themselves and then you can give them some suggestions on possible ways to to improve it on the next time they they brew it because they're they are a lot of people are participating just so they can get some some honest uh detached uh feedback you know because you know if you give a beer to your friend you know, it's a touchy situation. You may not want to be as honest as you possibly could be sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Especially wanna... considering they're getting free beer from you. They don't want the source to dry up. <laughs> <laughs> so we just go down go down the list. We, we have aroma. We have appearance. We have flavor. So we just look at the guidelines. Uh, moderate, roasted, grainy, sharpness. Uh, optionally with light to moderate acidic sourness and medium to high hop bitterness for this beer. That's a tasty beer. Yeah, I, I, I initially taste like a like a dark roast, mm-hmm. you know. In, in the coffee terms, it'd be like a like a French roast type type, a little little more intense roast in there, which I think is completely appropriate. Um, I get a little bit of caramel notes, but then I get a real bitterness from most likely hops, that like an aggressive hop bitterness that shows up, and it's it's there. It, it may be slightly. I don't think we do. We have a steward. Yes. Okay. So it, <laughs> it, it may be a little high for the dry stout category. It could push it into the American stout, which is a little bit more hop forward. You know, we'll just have to evaluate it at the end. And, you know, one thing, one thing I do, like when I'll, when I'll move on to the next category, I'll start with the aroma and smell it. I'll go to the appearance and I'll go to the flavor and I'll just keep on revisiting things. Sometimes that can come back and you'll pick up something that you didn't before from, you know, the carbonation waning, the, the, the temperature of the beer starts to rise a little bit and you may pick up some more nuances. So it's always good to just keep on revisiting in, in case something else shows up that, that, that wasn't there before. Very good. And the carbonation level is good, which probably adds to the, the sharpness of the, uh, of the flavor as well. Yeah. Mm. And again, I'm not tasting anything wrong 
with the beer as far as a defect in the brewing process. Uh, I would agree. You know, there's it's a, there's a robustness to it. It's not overly done. It's not overly, you know, uh, a blast of alcohol, which, you know, the dry stouts, you don't want it to have it be that. You want to have a real dryness to it. This certainly has that, you know, and there's a, there's a good bitter backbone to it. So, you know, there's nothing off that's really slapping me in the face like sometimes it does. And the mouthfeel is good as well. It's not thin. No, I'd say it's it's medium to full in the body. You know, there's not a whole lot of residual sweetness because I think the roast kind of tamps that down. But it's not. It doesn't have a thinness. It doesn't have too much. It's, it's it, it kind of threads the needle right right in the middle of where it should be. And so we like for aroma. It's the score is something out of twelve. Yes. Appearance is something out of three. You know. Flavor is worth 20 points, mouthfeel 5, overall impression 10. So a, t- a total, potential total score of 50. Now, nobody's ever going to get 50, right? You know, I've, I've rarely given anything over 45, you know, because it, it, there's always room for improvement, and I could taste it the next day, and it may have a completely different score just based on what I drank before, you know, where my palate is at. You know, there's so many variables that, that you know, to have it just hit a perfect 50, I, I, would, lo- I would love to see that. But I'm not, you know, I'm not going to give away points because it's, I like the beer. It's got to really, really earn that. And we've got bread and we've got water here for uh, uh, to kind of clear our palates between each beers and sometimes between each taste, you know. Absolutely, because, you know, basically the bread and the water, it resets your palate. And sometimes you need to stop, look away, you know, exhale. Reset your palate and start all over again because, like I said before, when you go through each one again, you may pick up something you didn't before because you, you can get palate fatigue. Although, you know, we're not drinking a whole pint of this, we're, we're kind of sharing a, a 12 ounce bottle, and you know, half of it's still in the bottle because we're just having a sample of it. So, um, and, and we may the way we're doing this is uh, uh, Stephen and Bryce are, are over there, we're kind of splitting this category, so they're judging some, we're judging some. And we'll do kind of a mini best of show uh, for this. So we may, we'll probably want some left in the bottle. Well, with any luck, they may have another another uh, bottle because I, I believe they give out th- they have three bottles be here. So it'll be one for now, and one for the mini best of show. And if that goes on, it could be for the for the best of show for the, for the entire competition. So we're we're doing well. How are you guys over there doing? We're doing great. I I like this beer a lot. I wonder if you're judging the same beer. Probably not. But anyway, we've got a really nice beer over here to work with, I think. So, it's cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, nice dry stout. Nothing, I didn't taste any flaws in it. Um, slightly tannic is all I could say. It was maybe a tiny bit negative, but not not real bad. It was delicious. Yeah, well, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> no, quit copying off of him, Steve. <laughs> it's, it's, it's roasty and delicious. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> Well, we've got we've got to, a lot more beers to, to get through, and uh, we'll come back in a little bit and and uh, add a little more. But we got some work to do. Indeed, I, I appreciate your advice, and I and I will lean in, in reality here, not just just recording. I will lean on your expertise uh, as we uh, as we soldier on. Great, that's what I'm here for. It's going to be fun. Thanks, man. So we're at the end of the round. We've done some tasting. Uh, I think I think overall it sounds like uh, Matt, you, our table fared a little better than than Steve and Bryce's uh, table. So we heard more moaning over on that side. That's just because I need a truss. <laughs> <laughs> you can only sit for so long. I can only sit for so long. <laughs> no, we had some good beers. We had some really nice beers. We had a really nice foreign extra stout, and we had a really nice American stout. A sweet stout that Bryce liked quite well, and uh, there was another one, but it slipped my mind. Stout that was very good too. The first one we tried. Yeah. yeah, we also had some very good beers. We did. I was uh, pleasantly surprised. You know, uh, sometimes you don't know what you're getting yourself into when you enter some of these categories as, as a judge. And you know, I had very little diacetyl, very little acid aldehyde. You know, bombers. There were a couple of stinkers, but you know, the, you kind of expect that. But uh, overall, I was I was quite pleased with uh, with what we tried. So, what did we like the best? I mean, there were we were judging American stouts, we're judging sweet stouts, and dry stouts. Uh, we there was an American stout that we liked quite a bit. Stouts, 
uh, foreign extra stout, oatmeal stout. What else was in there? Dry stout, sweet stout. That's about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, really, we only had a, our, our flight, really, we had one beer that was just so problematic that it, it was just really infected. Uh, our hope is that the, the batch wasn't, but that the bottle was. Um, and then we had another beer that, was, uh, that we actually scored quite high. We gave it 39 points, but it, uh, the presentation of the beer was just atrocious. So... What do, you, what do you mean by that? I mean, clean your labels. I was uh, clearing my palate. Oh. <laughs> clean, clean the labels off your beer. You know, it's like you'd scratch the labels yeah. off or she, you don't know who brewed it. And there was a ring around the outside of the cap. So not inside, but the, the outside of the neck uh, that was just dirty and rusty. And so it was like the beer had not been uh, handled well and, or bottled with any kind of pride, for lack of a better word. And so when we, when we were handed the beer, we went, oh. You know, we're going to score this. I mean, we just had no hope for this beer. Was, yeah, this is going to be not good at all. Um, so it was hard to overcome that. I mean, when we tried the beer, it was definitely good, but it's hard to overcome a bad presentation on your bottle. Well, you know, that's one thing you need to look at, too. The bottle presentation is, is a, a box to check and not to score. So it's something to acknowledge, but it doesn't require any input as far as the final score. That's exactly right, and that's what's so interesting because that was our highest rated beer. Yeah. It was the beer that we thought would be no way, you know, we didn't even want to drink this. It had the most points of all the beers we scored. Don't judge a beer by its cover, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, I mean, if we, if we come up with a beer like we had one that was the most unusual beer I think we've ever poured, it didn't gush out of the bottle, but when we poured it in the plastic cups, it grew and grew and grew and grew inside the, you know, the nucleation points in the bottom of the cup. Uh, allowed the beer to grow we as judges it's not our responsibility to say maybe this is a bad bottle can we have another bottle right well I think clearly it was a bad bottle because not only did it have that you know ever increasing level of foam in the in the glass but it also had sour notes to back it up so that tells me you know some secondary fermentation of a wild yeast or or bacteria or whatever kind of gave it a little extra kick in the bottle so you know and the flavors backed it up so uh, but but we don't know if that was the whole batch or just that one bottle that's a very good possibility it could be just that bottle and that's why i noted in the, in the overall impression you know this bottle was was spoiled you know and you know here's what you might want to consider you know but it's but it's not our what i'm getting at is if we get a bad beer it's not our responsibility to go and check another bottle of that batch Right. I mean, we get the, we get the bottle. We judge that bottle. And I agree with that. You know, the only in, in my experience, the only time you'd want another bottle is if you know you're getting two completely polar opposite um, views on the beer from different judges, and you may need like, well, let's get a fresh bottle. Let's start over. Let's make sure that you know there's all the parameters exactly the same. But as far as if we're both picking up the same thing, and it's just off the Richter scale of you know something's wrong here. Well, then it's likely that bottle, and we're all picking it up. So pay attention to your sanitization when you bottle, because you could have you could send in two wonderful bottles of beer and one stinker, and if that one stinker was the one that they that they picked, uh, then <laughs> was that a that's 350 from American? It'll be landing soon. <laughs> I could quote something from Caddyshack, but I'm not going to do it. Rodney Dangerfield, something about Amelia Earhart. But anyway, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so anyway, it pays to pay attention. I mean, and you know that that one bottle that you guys thought was nasty looking. Oh, there's a, is that the same one? Probably, I'm guessing it's from the same brewer. Yeah, and, the uh, label is not cleaned off well, and it just. It, yeah. yeah, at least they're consistent, right? <laughs> it just looks like something you've done. Hopefully it's consistent uh, yeah. in the bottle because it was actually good beer. So Yeah, so pay attention, clean your bottles, give a good presentation. And, uh, I know you're not supposed to judge on it, but, uh, I mean, come on. You know, we all judge on looks. Yeah. And uh, it's just something that you kind of do. So it turned out to be a very good beer. You're not supposed to judge on looks, but when you first look at it, your first impression is, oh, this is going to be not very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could get the you could get the impression like, wow, this person didn't really do what it took, you know, to have the complete package here, you know, the, the liquid in there. It, what else did they overlook, you know, if they're overlooking the initial impression? So I think that's why it's a part of it. But at the same time, you need to look past that 
if the beer speaks for itself. So I know, you know, we judged a bunch of beers. I don't know how many, but uh, by the end of it, my palate was getting fatigued and I couldn't smell things, you know, like I could at the beginning. And and um, so it was it was more of a struggle. I was eating more bread. I was drinking more water. Did you guys find the same thing? Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard, too, when you're going from one beer to the next because you might have scored one on Aroma, for example, and then you get one that's... It's even better, so you want to go back and change your score because you don't want to go too high on certain things. It's just uh, it's it's hard to score them like that one at a time. I thought um, you do your best, I guess, and that's what you do. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got some palate fatigue too, James. I just uh, I was kind of worn out with the with the stouts. You know, by the time we got through with it, to be frank. I was thinking about dinner tonight, and there won't be a stout included <laughs> with that. But I, uh, the other thing I would say too is that um, that you know, as we as in this this style of judging, and you're trying to move through the beers quickly, um, I found that I was going back and revising my aroma scores because as the beers opened up, so I was judging them very quickly. I was moving really quickly through aroma and appearance, and okay, let's drink the beer, let's taste the beer, and writing it down, and then I would give it a moment to open up and and revisit that beer. So. Um, I don't know what that says about it, but just just a cautionary tale to pay attention to how the beer opens and warms and, and what it does to your palate and, to your, and really to the aroma as much as anything. That, that goes back to what you were saying in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the things you need to realize is that the aroma, you're going to pick up more components of the, of the beer's flavor through the aroma. Yep. So, like, every time I, I, I take it, I start over with a new, you know, sip, I'll, I'll smell it. I'll check what I wrote. And if something else is there, I'll make a note of that because it does open up. It warms up. It, it You know, the carbonation kind of, you know, gets tamped down a little bit. So then you can start seeing these other flavors and, and aromas emerging. So, you know, I don't just go straight to tasting it every time. I smell it every time. I make sure that there's something new not, not emerging. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I, I found, for example, there was an American stout that uh, at first didn't have a lot going on for it for me but as it opened and as it warmed the chocolate notes really came through and it, it acquired a kind of creamy soft chocolatey thing that I just found great I mean I really liked it uh, regardless of what style it was or what pigeonhole I was trying to put it in I really liked that beer and it had a lot to do with it warming properly I agree it... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes I agree <laughs> Bryce is playing Andy Sparks in that role. <laughs> yes, what you said. Or, no, that's what, usually that's what you say. But so now, so we kind of interrupted the the flow here. We've got to pick our little best of show here, right? And the best of stouts. Better, best of stouts, and then we'll we'll carry that on. So very, it's hard work. I mean, you know, people joke about, oh, yeah, drinking beer all day. It sounds like hard work. It is hard work if you if you do it right. You put a lot of thought into it because, you know, these people took the effort to package up these beers and send them in, and we owe them, you know, some feedback. So hope hope that we've been able to do that. So on to the next thing. Okay. We're on a food break here after the stouts, and we're here with the homebrewing hero, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Douglas Warzynski, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Douglas, I'm glad to be back. Thank you for coming to Salt Lake City. Good to see you again. I, I feel like we've seen you grow up because, you know, when we first talked to you, you were a, a law student uh, looking to change the law so you wouldn't have to lie on your on your uh, bar exam, right? Right. And now you've, uh, you, you, I don't know, you, were you married at that time or... I was married. I, I was married when I moved to Salt Lake City back in 2005 and started brewing shortly after moving here. Uh, my wife supported me dutifully through law school and uh, supported me through the whole you know, legalization thing and knowing full well I wasn't studying as much as I was supposed to because I was distracted with uh, going up to the Capitol and, and participating in hearings and talking with uh, the folks over at the American Homebrewers Association and Gary Glass over there. And so uh, Sarah has definitely been a, a stalwart supporter throughout all this. And then y'all have had a couple of couple of uh, fine young boys yes. since then. So uh, Two young men are, are now at the age of uh, five and two, which 
one knows how to help me uh, move the mash paddle, and the other one knows just enough to stay away from things that are hot. So uh, <laughs> they help, and uh, they're they're good to have around. They're good kids. So I feel like we've seen you grow up, and you're and you and you went from a law student to you worked for the government yep. uh, for a while, and now you're in private practice. I am. So congratulations on that. Thank you, sir. It's a new adventure and a bit of an experiment, but it's been working out well so far. <laughs> now you, this year. Uh, marks the year that now all 50 states uh, have homebrewing legalized. How awesome is that? And arguably, you were the guy who who started who pushed the boulder in that direction, so to speak. Because uh, before you guys legalized uh, homebrewing, it was stuck at five states for a long time. Yeah, a little over a decade. Although I am not advancing the argument that I'm responsible for it. But, um, I, you know, you can throw that at me every once in a while and I'll feel pretty good about it, especially after judging some flights in the morning and I'm willing to take a little more credit than I've earned. Sure. <laughs> but but if not you, who? Uh, you know, it was it was good fun. I think uh, obviously homebrewing in Utah and I as imagine in the other states had... Uh, a good, you know, foundation. Obviously, there was people that rose up and and did their part to participate in state government and, and make the law changes that were necessary. So, um, I was not, you know, the the initial brewer by any means. I uh, relied heavily on friends and local businesses like the Beer Knot and the Bayou here to, to sort of give me a, a toehold in the in the hobby. And um, it's been great. I've I've really enjoyed, you know, growing not only in my career, but in my homebrewing hobby, and, and gotten a little better, I hope, over the years. And and obviously, this is great. I mean, every year the hum, the, the homebrewing competition has taken place. The uh, entries grow up, and the number of judges we need go up, and the number of certified judges that we have goes up. So it's great. It's just all around awesome. So, what's your pr- perspective? I mean, you, I assume that you kind of watch from the sidelines uh, the other states as they went through the arguments and went through the legislative process. Uh, what what's your uh, Give me your color commentary, your uh, your perspective on all that. Well, you know, I mean, congratulations to everyone that put the time in. I think uh, some states definitely had more of an uphill battle than I did, and, and everyone here in Utah did. Um, I, I've seen, you know, some heartbreak in other states as it took years to, to make the passage. I mean, we it took us two years, two sessions in the legislative session to make it happen. But uh, I, by and large, I felt like... Uh, we had some very reasonable lawmakers, and uh, perhaps less so in some other states that were, uh, you know, a little, little more dug into their perceptions, shall we say, of the hobby. <laughs> you're, so, you're talking like a lawyer. <laughs> uh, I apologize. <laughs> you're being politically correct. Well, maybe we should wait till after I judge the meets, and then I'll, uh, I'll start. <laughs> and start another thing. My mouth a little more. <laughs> But it's great. I've loved listening to it. It was really fantastic. I've, of course, I've gotten most of my updates through uh, Basic Brewing Radio. But, um, I, you know, I celebrated with everybody else when, when the last state sealed the deal and, and it was legal across the board. So, Steve, your perceptions of, uh, of coming to Utah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure you had some preconceptions coming in. But uh, since you've been here in Salt Lake City, what do you think? Uh, I am uh, not surprised at how friendly the people are. I'm not surprised at how beautiful the city is, and the uh, the mountains just off to our I don't know if it's the, I think it's the east, from, yep. you know, from where we're at. But uh, it's just a lovely place. I've never been to Utah. I kind of grew up in Colorado, so the landscape is a little bit similar. You know, it feels homey to me. Um, and the beers are really good. We which made it to a couple of brew pubs last night, and the beers were great. And um, I don't know. That's just my perception. The Beehive is great. I mean, this is a great competition that we're getting to judge some cool beers today. So, yeah. Yay, Salt Lake City. Yay, Utah. Yeah, that's my plug Salt Lake City. So I do get a commission from the tourism board. <laughs> the Utah point. tourism board? The yeah. governor's check is in the mail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Send my kid to Boy State. <laughs> So has there, since the legalization, has there been any backlash at all, or has there any been, been any kind of uh, reaction one way or the other? Is it just kind of like normal all of a sudden? I think for the most part it's pretty normal. Uh, you see the occasional news article where it pops up, good or bad. I, there was, strangely, uh, south of the city, uh, a an in, in the basement distillation operation got oh. broken up, oh. and the police officers, when interviewed, uh, said, you know, well, distillation is certainly illegal, but homebrewing is still technically illegal. And I kind of took issue with the fact that he said still technically illegal, because 
we're really sort of in the opening years of it being legal, and so I, I shudder to think that there's at least some portion of the population that feels as though it's it needs to be unwound, um, whatever damage I, I've done to the state. But, um, <laughs> you know, for the most part, I think that it's been pretty positive. There has been some recent articles um, about the increase uh, female population that's been brewing in Utah. We have our uh, our own Jamie Burnham, who runs, uh, manages the Beer Nut. She's also uh, one of the key members of the Hot Bombshells, which is uh, an all-female home brewing club, and they do. Uh, they've submitted some great beers to the competition, I'm sure, and they're they're a fun group to be around. So, uh, I think the the hobby has grown up. I think the community sort of understands us. Um, you know, and truth be told, there's. Of course, in any law, right, there's going to be some ambiguity. Exactly how do you serve or transport home brew, and, and how tr- carefully do you tread? Um, you know, in a state where, you know, full-strength beers aren't, aren't served on tap in beers, uh, any time a home brewer talks about, you know, having three or four taps of home brew in their basement, I sort of cringe a little, and I think, well, you know, I, I can't opine one way or another as to whether or not that's okay, but that's certainly drawing some additional publicity to the hobby. Uh, which is, of course, a good thing, but you're never quite sure how, uh, how some people react to the expanding hobby. And so um, I'm very happy the hobby is expanding the way it is, and I, and I hope it's, it's perceived as being a very positive thing in the state. Uh, we certainly have all the typical arguments being advanced by you know, local breweries that say, listen, you know, home brewers become brewers, brewers become tax revenue. It's a part of you know, an economic development thing. So I hope, it's, I hope by and large it's good. But, you know, we keep, I keep my eye on things just to make sure we're, we're uh, still in good stead with the lawmakers. Ever, ever, vigi- ever vigilant. Agreed. I've, I've yeah. judged flight. Ever vigilant. <laughs> Douglas Swarzynski, homebrew hero here in Salt Lake City. <laughs> Cue the music. <laughs> So, Steve, we're, we're sitting here. I feel like I'm at a golf tournament just on the sidelines in the whispering tones. We're watching beer judges judge Category 23 specialty beers. It's, it's a tough category, and uh, I think the fairway is open on the left side. I'm seeing, oh, there's some roasted coffee going down right now. And, it, oh, it's a, it's a good drive. Yeah, right, straight down the middle of the style guidelines, I think, maybe. I'd say. Sorry. We're, <laughs> you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm Bonnie. And I'm here with Steve. And I'm Steve. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> As always. We, we're, we're imposing upon the, uh, the table here, you're judging uh, Category 23 specialty beers, which to me it might be the hardest category to judge, and Bonnie's nodding. Yes, it's I. We've had a lot of uh, discussion of this because there's such a variety of beers that get entered into this. Um, and certainly, our first question that we ask ourselves when you're judging a category like this: Does it belong in a different category? Um, because it, it's such loose definitions as far as you know, based on BJCP standards, such loose definitions on what's appropriate and how to judge it. So, it's a hard category. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. There's no right or wrong way to judge this category, that's for sure. So is, is the first question you got to ask, uh, does it actually belong in a slot? Yes. Yeah, that's, I, I would say that's, um, and right in the BJCP, that's what it says. Starting out, it says, okay, the first question, this is a catch-all category, pretty much everything goes in here, except does it belong somewhere else? And that's really the first question I think we've asked as we've tried each of these beers so so far. And what's a percentage of those that do belong somewhere else and, and that do are actually specialty beers? At least 30%, if not more. I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I did this category last year. And we literally, it, it took us the longest to get through that specific category because there's so many questions, you know, so many different things, like linking these beers to maybe other beers. Um, you don't really, it's, it's hard. I don't know. And so, and so do you do you get I saw that you guys were, were 
we're um, uh, looking at, at, you ask the steward to look at the actual entry sheet, and so you get a little bit more leeway with this category to kind of get more background on the beer before you judge it, or? No, you have the opportunity to uh, figure out what else has went into this beer, you know, what their base style is. Um, you don't get any other information other than the ingredients they've actually listed. That's the only other information you can pull from there. So... So you don't know who no, brews you it. No you idea just who it is. Nothing like they cannot reveal that to you. You are left blind on that end. All you get are ingredients. So so, so you you know what to look for when you're when you're tasting. Mm -hmm. So what what are we what are you judging right now? Um, currently, it's and again this is why we have this uh, score sheet pulled or the. Sorry, the score sheet with the um, brewer's notes pulled is because the basic information we were given was that it had um, coffee and cocoa nibs and um, lactose in it. And of course, so I, I hear that and I'm thinking that's a breakfast stout. That's yeah, completely a, what it tastes like. Stout. It's a, a milk stout with, you know, coffee added to it, a breakfast stout. Um, and so when we had him pull the sheet, it didn't say it was a stout though. So we had him pull the sheet to establish that before we even opened the bottle. I wanted to mo know more information about this beer. But this is a great example of one that that probably would have fit better into, you know, like the spice beer category with um, it being a milk stout that has an addition of um, coffee and cocoa to it. So, um, but again, it's very good. <laughs> Working on it right now, it's very good. And um, it's hard, in the, especially in this category particularly, because it is such a catch-all, but that would be the one brewers as you're you know deciding where to enter it in these competitions to take that into consideration will it fit it better into a different category and don't think because specialty says it's a catch-all that that's necessarily where it should go you know because it might show better in a, in a different category so and what's what's your background in in brewing and beer <laughs> well, home brewing mostly. Um, I've I've helped my husband quite a few times. He's a very experienced home brewer, but I've done several myself, and I have several in this competition actually. Um, but and I've, I judged last year, and I've stewarded before for several beer contests or competitions. Um, I'd say my my main background is just enjoying beer a lot and drinking a lot and learning a lot about it, reading as much as possible about it. It's all research. It. It's all research, <laughs> exactly. The fun, the fun type, um, drinking it, obviously, and the really interesting type that's still fun is reading about it and getting to know more about the styles and, you know, what goes into them, so in the technical aspect of them, so. But. Um, I actually got into home brewing um, when I started working at the Bayou. Um, got interested in all the different beer styles and all of that, uh, what you could do, different flavors, everything, I mean. And so I was curious as to the full process of brewing, like how it all works, like how to, how can somebody make so many different types of beer, you know, instead, of, you know, with a lot of the same ingredients, but how can they get so many different flavors? So, I mean, I got into it just by being curious, and then I started making my own home brew, and, you know, learned a lot more doing that, because you get a chance to pick it apart, you get a chance to see what goes into different styles, and it helps you understand, you know, where a style gets its flavor from, where it gets its color from, aroma, everything, um, how it ferments, temperatures, all those things, um, just so many different factors to beer that there's a lot of combinations you can do so and this is the perfect category to illustrate that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what was do you remember what the specialty beer uh, that won the category was last year I don't <laughs> I I, I didn't judge it. I didn't get to judge it, although I did um, kind of crash the mini best in show because if there's good beers around, you know, I'm going to go <laughs> try to try them. Um, and I remember there being a really good sati um, that was represented. Um, there was a... I'm trying to think of what the base beer was. It had pepper addition to it. I think it was possibly a cream ale with the pepper, and uh, that one was really solid, and that was one of the mini best in show entries. Um I don't know. Yeah, I didn't get to judge it, unfortunately. But those were two standouts that I remember that were kind of... And again, it's uh, just kind of those um, odd. They don't really have a home other places, so they get to come here. To <laughs> so. Well, very good.
we'll, we'll step back. We'll, we'll step back and watch from the sidelines again, Steve. We're okay, when, uh, after the break, we'll come back, and uh, I think there will be some coffee yeah. and some cocoa headed our way. <laughs> Steve, we're here with another hero of ours, Jamie Burnham. From the, you're the, are you the manager officially? Was your, is that manager. still your official title yeah. of the Beer Nut? Yes. You're in Salt Lake City. Yes. And uh, we have to, we have to say thank you to you because uh, you know you you put our D- DVDs in your homebrew kits, yes. your equipment kits, and so you have helped keep us going over these years. And so you've been with us a long time. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> they're really, like they're very, very helpful and. Great. We put them in all of our basic beer kits, and so anyone who buys a kit is a beginner. You guys are the first people they see awesome. <laughs> once they get started. So yeah. Woohoo! So here we are. This is the uh, the fifth. The fifth. Fifth annual Beehive Brew Off. This is amazing. It's, it's hard to believe that it's been this long. Mm-hmm. I mean, we I came out for the second. Couldn't make it for the first, unfortunately, but came out for the second, and we've been, you know, we talked to Douglas earlier, and uh, following the progress of all the legalization and all that, uh, you got a ton of people here judging. Uh, how many entries do you have this year? I don't have an exact number, but I believe it was 590-something entries. And Trent's, there were a little over 200 people. Yeah. So that, uh, is it growing year after year? I feel like it's growing. Um, we have less entries than last year, but more entrants this year. We were really strict on only allowing one entry per subcategory. So that was the reason why we didn't have as many entries as last year. Last year we had 690. Uh, this year it's, you know, 590. So we're about 100 shy. But a lot of the people who have entered beer, were only to- they can only enter a subcategory one time. So I think that that really shaved off about 100 beers. But more people are joint- like doing the competition every year. It's pretty awesome. Um, I think we started like 120 was the first year of entrance. And with 330 entries. And yeah, so it's, it's grown a little bit. Um, and I think it's helpful too that we've got, this, the, there's another homebrew shop in the south end of the valley. And it sort of like feeds the competition for us too. So that's good. So the, they say competition is good. Uh, now you've got competition uh, in town. Is it good? It's good. I feel like, you know, I mean, homebrewers are all a big community. And, and oftentimes, if we don't have something at the Beer Nut, we'll say, would you like us to call Salt City for you and see if they have it? And they do the same for us. So it's, it's you know, a community. We're really just there to make sure that the customer has what they need. Awesome. Well, if, if craft brewers can collaborate... Uh, and be friendly with each other. Why not homebrew shop? Definitely. So, has how has legalization affected the hobby here? I mean, y'all were at the y'all were at the front end of, of legalization. You know, when you started, uh, there were five states that uh, where it still was not legal, uh, but you were kind of at the front end of this last push to to have all the states uh, legalized. What difference? have you seen since the legalization? How has it changed the community? You know, there are some increases in numbers. Um, there, we had a really, really strong customer base before legalization, and so it's slowly, grow, slowly grown. We haven't seen an exponential jump. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, friend of a friend of a friend is brewing and we do get a lot of people that come in and make beer and make a couple batches and then take a long time off so and it's hard to tell in the summertime because that's our slow season for us but you know in the around christmas time when we're pumping out basic beer kits there we have there are a lot of people out there brewing um whether that has anything to do with legalization i'm not sure maybe because you know there's not the stigma behind it anymore but there's also those that are like, oh, well, it's legal now, so we're not bootlegging. I mean, not bootlegging, but, you know. Um, it's not as fun anymore? Yeah, well, it's always fun for me. But, yeah, maybe they they have that mindset that it's not as fun. There's, that, there's not that aspect of doing something dangerous. Yeah, they're, no, they're no longer breaking bad. They're exactly. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, uh, I mean, the, you are, I mean, Utah is a... Uh, is a you know fairly conservative state, uh, and and it was you know kind of su- surprising to some people I'm sure that y'all were able to get, get the legalization through. 
Uh, the fact you, that we weren't last, that we were the first of the five, the first right. of the last five to get it started, I think maybe that was like, oh, well, if Utah can get it passed, then yeah. maybe we should really, <laughs> really get this push going. And, you know, thanks to Douglas, I think that if he not pushed the issue, we wouldn't have been able to, I don't know that we would have done much to get it passed in our state. He was the catalyst for sure. And because of that, uh, Mississippi and Oklahoma and Alabama, all of them joined on board. Because you can't, you can't be last behind Utah. I mean, <laughs> we are very conservative. So the fact that we were the leaders was... Well, the, I mean, some people say, uh, you know, does it does it really matter if it's legal or not? Because I'm going to do it, whether it's le- you know it's legal or not. But uh, you know, we had where was it, Montgomery, Alabama? Where was it? There, there was a homebrew shop that was actually rated, rated, rated yeah. you know, where they what was it last year or year before where they actually took uh, homebrew equipment and they they actually confiscated books as yeah. well, homebrewing books as well. Uh, so. You know, I, I don't know if you were ever afraid of that kind of thing happening around here, but you know, if it, if the hobby is not legal, then then they might have a justification for doing something like that. Yeah, that's a concern for sure. I think that we always operated under the guise that it was federally legal. So, and although you know, states have the rights to do their their own set of laws. Federally, it's been legal since 1978. So. And we, there were, there have been a handful of shops that have opened or have been open in Salt Lake City at any given time since then. So, um, there's a shop in Ogden. Well, there's always been, I shouldn't say always. There's a shop in Ogden that was another business before. I mean, it's different owners and uh, shop in Ogden now. There's the Beer Nut, Arts Brewing Supply, Salt City Brew Supply. There's a tiny little shop in Richmond, um, in Cache County, um, and like some online stuff. But uh, the brick and mortar stores, I think the Salt, you know, Salt City and the Beer Nut are really like the two most successful businesses of them all. You know, the anchors. The anchors, definitely. Well, it's it's. Have, have you seen, you know, as working as the manager of this place, have you seen any kind of uh, change in the way that people regard you? I mean, did you get any negative feedback from people saying, oh, you work where? Oh, you know, was there any kind of looking at you in a certain way because the, the hobby was legal or illegal when it was illegal? Or uh, I think the only raised eyebrows I ever received were from my religious family. Oh. <laughs> Everyone else, um, you know, and Mark's done a really good job with uh, building up the store and the customer base in the beginning. And this is just, this hobby has so much passion surrounding it. There's very few people that would be like, mm, what are you doing and why are you doing it? So, and All you got to do is look at this group. I mean, oh, here we've got people drinking beer all day, uh, but they're doing so in a very thoughtful way and they're doing so in a very paced way. And, you know, there's food. Uh, and, you know, people are really thinking about all this and, and really, you know, it's an intellectual endeavor. It's not just getting together and drinking as much beer as you can. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's thinking about this beer as food uh, and, you know, about the crafting of it and, and really actually spending a lot of time in, improving it. And, and, you know, if, if there are skeptics, all you got to do is look around this room and see that it's a legitimate thing. Absolutely. Um, if only our legislature would come in and take a sneak peek. They're all afraid. <laughs> is it? Is it? I mean, Douglas was saying something about uh, uh, you know some comments that he had s- seen or heard in the news. Uh, is you can't you can't be too comfortable, right? I mean, no, definitely not. Especially with the. Uh, we like to nickname them the religious nature. <laughs> The, the the conservative religious legislators that we have are very loud voices, and those of us who are responsibly drinking and making beer, unfortunately, just don't have a voice. Um, so the fact that that Douglas contacted Christine and Christine pushed it through, I mean, she's no longer living in in the state of Utah anymore. It's it's really difficult for those who don't have 
the same mindset as the majority around here to be heard. So yeah, we out, we're always on our toes for sure. Hopefully, we'll never have to worry about them coming in and changing the laws or making it illegal again. I think that, you know, they'd like to make, I would like to think that they, you know, aren't bothered by us um, and, you know, continue to allow us to to run our, as we we were and will continue to be successful, so. Well, keep up the good fight. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Steve, for your comments. Uh, I was uh, very insightful and succinct as usual. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again to Steve, Bryce, Matt, Chelsea, Bonnie, Douglas, and Jamie. What a great time. I hope the hobby continues to grow out there, both on the uh, uh, amateur and professional level. Lots of great beer is being brewed in that area. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our Basic Brewing growler bags are available on our shop. Protect your precious homebrew and craft beer as you take it from place to place. Check out our support link where you can throw us a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to the podcasts. Uh, Help us pay for plane tickets and such so we can go to more fun places. Uh, Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kids. You can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. Uh, Don't forget our Brewer's Logbooks are on the store as well. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on BasicBrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Glencoe Chemistry, Matter and Change, Student Edition. And, boy, if, if, if that's a textbook, textbooks are expensive. Whew. And 700 Poop Bag Shop Dog Waste Bags. Uh, durable premium bulk refill rolls, blue or black color plus bone dispenser. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support, and we greatly appreciate your cleaning up after your puppy. Don't forget... Don't forget that you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or subscribe to and and or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>